Hello everyone and welcome to our Austral Group webinar. My name is Vanessa Gonzalez and I am Peru Destination Leader at Austral Group. And our guest speaker today is Ignacio Barrios, Peruvian chef and owner at Urban Kitchen, a unique concept of sharing experience about the Peruvian cuisine. A little background on Ignacio Barrios. After almost five years abroad, Ignacio Barrios returns to Lima with the idea of starting a project of his own. Ignacio's experience began in London, where he worked in restaurants such as Wild Honey, a Michelin star, and Dale's Ford Organic. Then traveled to Madrid uh, to work for more than two years in the cuisine of Astrid and Gaston. A quick background about Austral Group. I know you're all familiar with our customized high quality study trips with rich educational content, seamless logistics, cultural activities and consulting projects. Just to remind you, we organize these unforgettable immersion experiences for MBA, EMBA programs to Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Panama, Peru and the USA. So let's get started. All of you will be able to watch the webinar in real time. The chat window on your right is available for your comments and interaction. We also have a poll on the right side of the screen. If you have any questions for the speaker, please write it in the question window. After the presentation, we will do a Q&A with Ignacio Barrios, so he will answer as many questions as possible. Just a reminder, this webinar is being recorded so after it is concluded, you will receive an email with a link to watch it again at any time you wish. I will now pass the microphone to Ignacio Barrios. Uh, hi, good morning. Um, well, the idea now is to give you a little bit of background on, on what has happened in, in Peru uh, in the last few years. But for that, I'm going to go uh, actually back in our you know, history a little bit and our position in, in the world to give you all the, all the foundations and the basis on um, what we are seeing about Peruvian gastronomy right now, which is something very, very interesting that has happened in the, in the last few years. Uh, first, um, I know probably you all know uh, Peru, where it is and, and what we have, but uh, there are a few facts that are very, very important that I, that I need to, that anyone needs to consider in order to, to understand um, Peruvian cuisine. You know? First, uh, Peru uh, as a country has 24 of the different 34 climates that exist in the whole world. And if we go to the uh, microclimates that exist in the world, we have 84 of 114. Uh, things like the Andes, the Amazon, um, the, the, uh, the different altitudes, for example, in the Andes, and some phenomena that occur in the Pacific Ocean make that happen. So imagine one country in the world that has almost 80% of the available climates that exist in the world. You know? Meaning that the, the, the amount of products that we can, we can have in our country, it's almost you know, everything that you can find in the world. Um, the diversity of regions, it's, it's unbelievable. You know? there, there's this uh, Peruvian historian that described eight different types of natural regions uh, going to altitudes and not only the altitude, but also also where you are located, because it's different 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 meters above sea level in the Andes in the west side than in the east side. 2,000 meters above sea level in the east side of the Andes is the jungle. So it's a jungle at 2,000 meters above sea level, so you can find different kind of things. In that, thinking about that biodiversity and different type of climates, the thing is, at the end, what Peru has is uh, availability of products is much higher than, than in other places. So for example, things like asparagus, avocados, or mangoes, you can find them all year long, where in other countries or in other parts of the world, you only find them during their seasons, maybe two, three, four, five, six months a year. And then the uh, diversity of products is also very, very, very interesting. 
the Pacific Ocean also for us is really important. We have two phenomenons uh, that occur in, in our water constantly. One is a Humboldt current that brings cold water from the, from, from the Southern Pole. Uh, that never stops. It's a current that goes from the South, goes up, Chile, Peru, and then goes round and round and round and round. Uh, that, for example, brings a lot of microorganisms, which are food for small fish and seafood, which are food for medium fish and seafood. No? So at the end, our, our food chain is really interesting. So in two thirds of our ocean, we see a lot of fish that eat very well and that are in cold water. So when you're in cold water also, you develop fat, or the fish, not you. No? Um, and uh, they're tastier because they are bigger, they are fatter and they, they taste better. No? And the El Nino current, which is a hot current that occurs maybe every two years in the north part, uh, but also maintains the water high because of the area where the north part of Peru is located, which is the equator. No? So uh, we have all year long warm weather and warm water in the north and all year long cold water in the center of the country and in the south. Uh, so again, thinking about the products first, you have stability all year long and in our ocean as well. Uh, fish and seafood is the second most consumed animal protein in Peru. We eat more fish and seafood than beef, uh, lamb, pork. The only thing we eat more is chicken because it's cheaper and it's much more available. Um, when I, I, I always put an example, no? That imagine you trying to to cook something at home. You you get from your job, at your house. You open your fridge, and you have milk, chicken, and an onion. No? There's not much that you can do with that. Maybe if you're uh, very creative, you can do two or three things. But um, if you open your fridge and you have everything, you just went to, to the supermarket, uh, your creativity and, and the amount of, of dishes that you can do are much, much higher. No? And that's, I think, a good example of what happens in Peru, no? that uh, our fridge, that is our, our, our country, it's full of things. So it's easy for us to cook. That's why. Uh, we, have, we have a good foundation of products that make ourselves be creative in making our own food. Um, but that's the basics, the products. Then we have influences. First, cultural influences that have happened in our, in our country, in our history, actually. No? We start with a pre-Incan that you can see on your, your left. No? Those are all these small cultures that existed in Peru for thousands and thousands of years. You have to think about that. Peru is a country where the first building, the first pyramid was built in the whole world before anywhere else. So we have had civilization here and organized civilization here happening for thousands of years. Then the Inca culture, that was one of the most important cultures uh, from the old times. No? Then we were uh, conquered by the Spanish and we were governed by the Spanish uh, monarchy for hundreds of years. So we also have a, a modern, modern you know, European influence over there from the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s. With that influence, or also some Muslim influence, because you have to think about of the, of the cultural interchange between North Africa and Southern Spain for many years. And for that, we also grab some influence from them. Then African influence, uh, slaves came to work in, in America in general, so they came from Central Africa and they worked here. Uh, when slavery was abolished, we have a big influence from Asia, Japan and China especially, people who came to work in agriculture in Peru. And then maybe more modern, modern I'm saying 1900s, early 1900s, Italian, French influence, but probably in, in, in a small way, you know, uh, but you can, if you, if you go to a Peruvian restaurant and you eat the whole menu, which is very fun, um, eat the whole menu of a restaurant, um, you're going to see these slight influences in different dishes. You know? And there are dishes that actually have been evolving. You know? See, things like a ceviche it was a way to preserve the fish by the pre-Incan cultures in the northern part of Peru, the Mochicas. You know? They used to fish and it was warm weather, so after three, four, five, six hours, the fish started to taste off. So they started to put salt, chilies, and some kind of fruit uh, that would uh, help the fish preserve maybe for the next day. You know? 
but the ceviches we know now use limes, and limes came with the Spanish because we didn't have citrus fruit as we know them right now. They came with them. And now a ceviche is done at the moment. You go to a cevicheria, they cut the fish, they mix it, and they gave it to you. Maybe 50 or 60 years ago, it was done and it was marinated for three, four, five, 12 hours. So that making the ceviche in the moment is a Japanese influence in a dish because Japanese eat sushi, right? So that's how one dish that is very classic to us has a, a, a basics or a foundation in our history, but has been evolving. And that, those are things that are quite unique in, in Peru because not many cultures have absorbed other cultures like that, especially in their food. Um, these faces, uh, I don't know if you know any of them, but I, I've just put some examples of people who had um, who had made this small revolution in Peruvian food, probably in the last 20, 15 years. No, uh, people like Asuna Curio, Pedro Miles Quiafino, Cucho La Rosa, or Bernardo Rocarrey started um, something. But they saw an opportunity on this, our foundation these cultural interchange influences, this, this, especially in Lima, you know, how everything melted into, into one whole Peruvian culture. And they say, you know what, we have an opportunity here. We can put up to date Peruvian food and it should be good for everyone. You know? So they started small movements or restaurants, which uh, started to attract people coming to Peru and try their food or start to attract people from outside of Peru, taking them to other countries and to explain what they were doing. You know? The guys on the bottom are Micha and Virgilio. They own Maido and Central, which are restaurant number one and two in the Latin America 50 best restaurants, number five in the world 50 best restaurants, number eight in the world 50 best restaurants. So you know, they, they are the next generation, which are collecting what the other guys did and taking Peru into their highest uh, room as possible. You know? um, some facts or things that have happened in the few years that also show this, this, this evolution is that, for example, in 93, Le Cordon Bleu, which is probably the most uh, important cooking school, opened an institute in Lima, you know? first in South America, and, and, and it's, it's very, very important. Right now, they have a university actually here. Uh, probably 99 and early 2000 is where we started seeing all this, all this movement about TV shows, books, cookbooks. No? And now, I was reading the other day, there's more than 200 cooking schools right now, only in Lima. No? Um, there's, a, there's a book which is very interesting, it's called The Art of Peruvian Cuisine, which is the, the cooking book that has been uh, sold the most in the world uh, in, the last, in the last few years. No? Uh, things also interesting is, for example, in 2006, Peru was uh, declared the gastronomic capital of America you know, uh, in Madrid Fusion. And after that, in 2007, uh, Peru got this uh, gastronomy, the, our, our gastronomy was declared cultural heritage of the nation by the United Nations. Um, Mistura, for example, is a is a is a festival actually. It's a started as a gastronomic festival where good restaurants could cook for everyone and they could try what you couldn't because you didn't have the money to go to to pay for lunch in the restaurant. And now it's a festival involving more than four hundred thousand people that visits Mistura in one in one year. You know? uh, it has been also changing, changing locations, but. It's, it's a feast. It's one week a year. We all breathe about food. We go, we, we, we eat, we drink, we know about products. Producers from inside the country come to Lima to show what they're doing in, in this special uh, location. Then, uh, other things that have happened, for example, Peru was declared the main culinary destination of the world by the World Travel Awards for four consecutive years, from 2012 to 2015. We didn't won in 2016, and we won it again in, in 2017. So it's very interesting as well how we are being seen by people outside of, of Peru. You know? uh, in, in 2015, Lima was already a Latin American city with more, with more tourism, which is something unbelievable. You know? More thinking about the background of Peru in the 80s and the 90s. You know? It was a country where 
no one wanted to come. So that change also has been very, very good and, and, and quick. You know? It's not only been a, a tourism, it's been many, many things. And the government also has, has worked a lot on, on evolving uh, things around tourism. You know? um, as I told you, there are now Peruvian restaurants in the list of the best restaurants in the world. Uh, services has also uh, been better, you know, like markets, the gastronomic tours, festivals, uh, new businesses uh, around the gastronomy that have been uh, have been created in the last few years that has success. So we are also um, happy because we are seeing not only we cater for locals but also for people that come to that come to Peru. And one example is, is what I do. I have I have urban kitchen, which is actually a space where people come and cook together, uh, guided by a by a by a professional chef, and we do these uh, we do these experiences. You can you can think of them as a cooking class, but 100% hands on, and we try to give a little bit of background. For example, for people who visit. Um, uh, which are especially interested in uh, the gastronomic scene. You no, know? we can do special menus. We can do special cooking classes. We can do presentations like these ones as background of what has happened in our country in the last few years, and then they can cook two, three, four, five, six different uh, local dishes. So they can get a little bit of everything. You know? um, the idea is it's, it's a space where we do you know like easy going and fun experiences, but with something that can support. If they only want to learn, we go more for the technique, but if they also want to learn about our culture and our country, we go with some background uh, for that. We do cooking classes, we do a lot of team building activities, for example, for local companies, which is which is very interesting. Market visits, uh, when people come and visit Peru, we try to take them to a market first, show them this biodiversity in there, you know, see the products, touch the products, learn about them and then we take them uh, and we cook with them you know? and of course we do any kind of private events uh, so we have some questions i think i've been hearing some pips so those are the questions uh, i hope you enjoyed it if you have any more questions there's a question area over there on the right um, those are the questions excellent uh, different computer, so I feel like I'm on the matrix. No, excellent. Okay, then I have one first here. There is a what is the support of Peruvian government, if any, towards the position of Peru cuisine worldwide? Um, there, it's been there, there is a lot of support actually, and not only support, but I, I, I've understood that there's a there's um, there's a need as well. No, Peru. The government has seen an opportunity on promoting our country by promoting our food. So the best example I can give you is on Monday, I'm taking a plane, I'm going to Bogota in Colombia, and then spending five days over there, paid by the government, doing demonstrations, cooking classes, uh, TV appearances, uh, cooking classes in universities, and participating on a, a tourism fair called Anato, which is one of the most important tourism fairs in Latin America, a, and promoting Peruvian food for that. So I do think that there's there, there's a lot of support, and a, a, and now it's not only support; it's also a need. There's a there's a office called Prom Peru, which promotes Peru as a as a destination, and it's a part of the Ministry of Foreign Business. And, and they work a lot. Then I have a question from Jessica that says, what fruit did people use to preserve fish before lines? Uh, there's one special fruit that was, the one that we know that, that the Mochica culture used is called tumbo. Tumbo is a long, small fruit that looks sort of like a small banana, but inside is actually like a passion fruit. It has seeds and it has a very high acidity point. And that's the fruit they used to use. They used to rub that seeds with uh, the, the, the jelly style of, uh, of, of the part of the fruit. And that's the fruit that they, they used to use. Probably they used to use more, but that's the one that we know about uh, better. You know? 
Then Ephraim asks me, how has the aspect of gastronomy impacted even the street market food a lot? Uh, you have to think about if, if you have traveled to, to third world countries, I don't know if that's correctly said or not, um, politically correct. Um, usually markets are very, very local, no? So they are, they, you just go, you buy, and they're kind of dirty, kind of, you know, like going to the, the, the bad part of, of the city. But right now there are a few markets, for example, in Lima, especially in the area where we have more tourists that are very nice, actually. They're really nice, they're open, they're clean. Uh, of course, they charge you a little bit more, but then at the end, I, I prefer to pay a little bit more for, uh, for, uh, for a good, nice place uh, than for a dirty one. No? Uh, and that's also helping us, which are in the business, that we can promote much more. No? I, I also work, for example, with travel agents and say these guys are, you know, have a lot of money and everything. And then they say, which market are you taking them? Because I don't want them to go to any market because it's going to be dirty and unclean. So there has been a good, a good impact also in, in there. Uh, aha, another question from Giselle. What are the new trends on gastronomy or the food sector linked with technology? Aha, that's a good one. Uh, well, in general, I think technology has been um, changing the gastronomy scene in, in, in the world. You know? um, first of all, technology directly used in changing the way we cook is something that has happened in the last, I'll say, 80 years, maybe. Uh, machines that cook for you better than you and a, and a pan. You know? uh, and that has, of course, in, in, in some countries, uh, impacts first and then in others. You know? And then also technology as a way of uh, showing, you know? uh, e-learning, for example. You know? uh, how many people now take a cooking class and how many people go on YouTube and learn how to, how to, how to cook? So, for example, for us, especially in Peru, uh, it's, it's very important because we can promote also Peruvian food much more easier because of technology. You know? Look what we're doing right now. This, this is you know, me making a presentation about Peru and talking to you about the ideas of Peru, uh, inviting you to come next year to Peru. Um, in, 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 a, in a machine, in a computer. No? Um, so I do think that we always need to be careful and we need to uh, be on, on this technology wave because if we don't, if we don't surf the wave, we, we lose it. Uh, so, so I would say that probably things like doing this and trying to promote our destination uh, and using technology for that, it's great because then someone can come and can live the experience uh, as, as it is. Aha, this is a good one. Apart from ceviche, what are some other must-have recipes? Uh, if you have two hours, I can start giving you my list. No, um, I would say that the ceviche world is, is something very interesting because not only ceviches, but tiraditos, which is like a variation on ceviches. Uh, it's more like a, another type of cut of the fish, more Japanese style. Um, then lomo saltado, it's a, it's a must for me. It's a, it's a dish that also shows a lot of the Chinese influence. There are some stews that, that work uh, really good, like ají de gallina, carapulcra, uh, arroz con pato. Arroz con pato is actually duck with rice, uh, but first you make a stew with the duck and then you mix it with the rice. So that's very interesting. It's a cilantro-based uh, dish. Causa is something that I like a lot. Uh, it's a potato, it's like a mashed potato, but we eat them cold and seasoned with uh, um, uh, lime juice and chili peppers. We use a lot of chili peppers in Peru, but then the, the main objective on the chili pepper is not to, not to generate a lot of spiciness, but a lot of flavor. No? So, um, so you're gonna see, uh, the most of our dishes are done with chili peppers, but yeah, they, they, they don't have to be actually really, 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 really spicy. Um, okay, I have another question around, which is the role of micro farmers or producers at current uh, gastronomy chain? 
I would say that as everywhere in the world, we need to we need to look out from for uh, micro farmers or small producers. No, they. I think we have a responsibility on on, on not letting them die uh, in this process. Uh, it's very important for us as as uh, restaurateurs or, or if we have businesses uh, to try to know where our products are coming from. Peru, you need to think about that. that, that um, uh, agriculture in Peru is very fragmented. You know? In the 70s, we had this agricultural refor reform done by a left-wing government that took out all the land and then gave them to small, to, to a lot of people. You know? it, was a, it was a reform that wasn't done, wasn't, it wasn't a good one, actually. But what it did, especially it fragmented a lot the agriculture in, in the country. So now a lot of people producing a lot of things. So uh, the government is trying to help them out. There's a lot of uh, non-governmental offices also trying to help small producers and to organize themselves to see how they can produce better, more things at a fair price. They can earn more money. And then we, the other ones which we were buying, see uh, an opportunity. You know? Um, so, so it's a, it's a, it's an active role that we need to actually, we need to actually play right now. Um, and, and, you know, there are always going to exist big agricultural companies. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't buy from them, but we should take care of our small producers, um, for sure. I think we're good in time. There are no more questions around here, and well, uh, thanks to to Austral for for the invitation. I'm always very happy to work uh, with you guys, and thanks a lot for the people who were connected and saw the uh, the presentation. If you have any more questions in the next few days, you can let me know. I'll try to to contact you later, and I hope to see you here in Peru this year or the next. We can we can prepare very interesting. Um, experiences for you guys. So thanks a lot. I hope to see you soon. Thank you.